next speaker is uh, Jeff Finkelstein of Cox Communication with the HSC Uvolution from Doxister Fibre to the Home. Uh, I think we're going to have a changeover of microphone if Jeff's... Okay, that's fine. Um, Jeff, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. No, that's not going to do <laughs> at all. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. That's more like it. So, trying to figure out how to how to go through this because I know we're a, a bit, quite a bit late. So, a couple things, and uh, so I've been working on Doxis since about '96, and. Uh, the uh, gentleman who taught me pretty much everything I know about HFC is actually sitting here in the front row, so I'm quite scared at the moment. Um, but uh, you're, you're very fortunate to have Ron here, quite, quite honestly. So I've got a couple ways I'm going to go through this. So my position at Cox is I was responsible for deploying pre-DOCSIS and everything in DOCSIS up through 3.0, so I ran those teams. Cox is the third largest cable operator in the United States, over 10 million households passed, about 12 million RGUs, um, different services, uh, et cetera. So got quite a background in that. Spent a lot of time before that developing this thing called Unix at uh, Berkeley in California and Digital Equipment Corporation, a small Computer company became a large company, became a small company, became no company. <laughs> um, so I've got a good background in, in scheduling processes, things like that. Uh, so my role currently, or for the past five years, and actually I've been doing it for a long time prior to that, is, is what some people would call imagineering, visionary. Um, I don't actually have a job title, so I'm not a CTO though I do report to the CTO. So what I do is, is think about where things are going and develop our 10-year roadmap. I then hand the roadmap to engineering and they do what every good engineering organization to, should do. They put it on a shelf and they forget about it. But at least they have a good idea of where these technologies are leading. So a lot of what I do is come up with these ideas and challenge really smart folks like Ron and, and I'm sure you know Jack Moran and a lot of these folks that really, um, really are the smart kids. I'm more the business side of things, though pretty good background in technology. So uh, a couple things just wanted to kind of go over before I get into this. And one is um, how do you present this to executives? Because what I have to do is I have to go to our chief executives, which is basically the Cox family. We are still a private company. We've been owned by the Cox family since about 1898, I believe. And we remain private to this day, which means that we can do, in theory, all kinds of stupid things, and nobody ever hears about it. <laughs> and we're very good at doing that, by the way. <laughs> But what we do is we have the ability to try some things. Now, even though we're private, we still act like we're public internally. So what I had to do recently was I laid out our 10-year roadmap. And I'm going to take you through very quickly what I had to show to our chief executives, all of our C-levels. If anybody's here, here is a C-level, I apologize in advance. Um, but I'm going to go from there kind of quickly into the technology. So some of the trouble I've caused recently um, was coming up with some kind of crazy ideas, something that ended up getting called proactive network maintenance, active queue management, um, DOCSIS 3.0 service group bonding across service groups, silly things like that, but some of them actually work out. The beauty of being in the kind of vision game is, is that if I can bat 300, I'm doing pretty well. And uh, sometimes you bat five, sometimes you bat one, sometimes you strike out. So some of the things that we've come out recently is we started working on uh, distributed access architectures. I took that to Cable Labs in about 2009. 
roped this crazy man in called Tom Clonin, another crazy guy called John Chapman. And we, we sat there for a couple days and just kind of figured out what exactly is this thing going to look like? Well, now you know what it looks like. And uh, uh, we did it recently, even more recently, challenged some universities and some companies about how can we increase DOCSIS bandwidth? How can we get more frequency? And what came out of that was full duplex. So I've been on the full duplex team since the beginning, which was probably about four years now. It's been public, I guess, about a year. So I can give you an update on where we actually are with full duplex. You may like it. You may not like it. You'll live with it. So kind of start with the end of the story. And uh, the punchlines are that we spend about 85% of our network capex, we being Cox, I can't speak for anybody else, on our access network. So I define the network in five layers. I'll get to that shortly, but that's a lot of money. And so what are the no regret spends that we can make as we do this that will enable a variety of future technologies that we may or may not use, but that we're never going to regret spending. So I'm, I'm, I'm from the southern US, so you'll get a, a lot of southern colloquialisms in this. So the, my bottom line is, is the juice worth the squeezing? Because just because you could do it doesn't mean you should do it. But sometimes it's worthwhile taking some of those steps. For example, I, I have this whole set of rules. Um, I'm probably up to about 27 now. But rule number one is you can never have too much fiber, except in your diet. <laughs> because you're never going to regret having fiber. When we pull fiber, we pull fiber to the end of the trunks and to the ends of the feeders. We pull 288s and 144s. There was a lot of bloodshed to get that done. But to this day, we have never regretted that. So we don't always light it up. But it's there in the event that we need it. So when we do network planning, we base it on customer demand. And we look at that quality of experience during peak hours. And we all have oversubscription. Some may call it concurrency. We use about a 5% concurrency number. And uh, one of the great things that uh, uh, Tom Clunan did was come up with this algorithm for ways to calculate bandwidth. And then I kept bugging him, and we kind of took it and simplified it. You'll see some of that later. We've historically done a lot of carrier additions. At Cox, we do 32 6 megahertz downstreams. Now, we did build our plan out. One of my tasks um, was to go from a 750 plant to a gigahertz plant. So we, it took us four years for a couple hundred thousand miles of uh, HFC from about 2006 to 2010. So we're a one gigahertz system. We are now looking at building out to 1.8 gigahertz. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Hillermeyer promised me that in a few weeks' time, we will have amplifiers that can do that. Um, maybe not a few weeks, but maybe a little bit longer. But, uh, but, but it is, these are the kinds of challenges we throw out and just say, how can we do this? So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. 3.1 and, and FDX are really needed to enable one gigabit at higher penetration rates. So at 32 DOCSIS downstreams, we currently uh, believe we can provide 4 to 7% penetration on one gigabit downstream services. Now, we're still limited to 42 megahertz right now. We are looking seriously at an 85 split every time we touch, probably going to take it up to a 200 split. In the same way, we're going to go up to 1.2, but we're going to be putting in 1.8 taps. But to get to those higher rates and even higher rates where it becomes ubiquitous, you got to do a lot of plant work. So I'm going to take you through uh, kind of five topics here. So the first one is I think of the network in five layers. We have, you know, backbone. We all know what those things are. We've got about 18,000 miles of backbone. We ring the United States with two pairs. We break it into four quadrants uh, vertically, and then we bisect it uh, again, horizontally. 
We have uh, in our metro ring, we've got somewhere around 40,000 miles, 50,000 miles of metro fiber, just connecting all of our head ends. We've got a, about 180,000 miles of HFC. Um, we cover the, the large cities in the United States, San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Washington, D.C. area, Virginia, um, state of Connecticut, maybe not so big, Rhode Island. So, so we've got a lot of very dense urban settings. So from the edge, which you, you know, we can call it the MTC, the hub, the uh, head end, whatever terminology you want to use, through the outside plant into the customer prem. So that is really, it's those, those last three that, that are where a significant chunk of money is spent. So Ty, Ty covered this in, in, in very good detail about how we're going to make this transition from node five to node one to node zero. Node zero is where remote five comes in. Now, we keep talking, and there was a, a, a ongoing debate, remote five, remote Mac five. And as I like to say, whether it's remote five, remote Mac five, that's a religious discussion. It's a religious war. The only person who wins at a religious war are the arms dealers. So I don't personally care what it is, because to me, it's how do we get modulators and demodulators closer to the customer to get more bandwidth, to get analog optics out of the picture, to get higher modulation orders, to get more spectrum, and figure out how this stuff is going to work and how we're going to really meet the needs of our customers. So when I talk about bandwidth, you know, I'm, I'm explaining this to MBAs and, and PhDs in economics and all that. So I tend to use very simple drawings. Um, and plus, it's kind of the way I think about things. And, and just the bottom line is you got this big honking pipe. Um, if you don't get some of the southern colloquialisms, let me know. Um, so this big honking pipe. And we just break that pipe into downstream and upstream and et cetera. We share it across. Yeah, I guess that came through good. A, a whole bunch of homes. And then you just think about how much bandwidth there is here. Now, we break that spectrum into where we have you know, our upstreams. And, and you all are pretty lucky because you've got 65 and maybe even higher. And you're using 8 megahertz wide channels, not 6 megahertz wide channels. But in the end, we're, we still have this finite resource of spectrum. You can go higher. You may not go higher. It's going to be choices that we have to make. So what are your non-regrettable spends in there? One thing I do know is if you only put in 1 gigahertz taps, you're never going to get 1.2. If you only put in 1.2, you're never going to get 1.8. If you only put in 1.8, you're never going to get 3. So I'm a firm believer in... Uh, Tom Clunan and John Chapman's philosophy of, you know, we've done, we did testing on our hard, hard line cable. And uh, a little geek information there is we're at 875 P3 cables for our trunks. We, can, we got 10 gigahertz through that. That's a whole bunch of spectrum. Now, the reality of, of this is, is that, you know, spectrum is free to the almighty. We have to pay for it. So when it comes to what cables you're putting in as you rebuild things, and if you've got super duper HFC gurus, trust them. You know, if you've got folks that are your HFC folks that are very knowledgeable, but you need a little bit more expertise, talk to this gentleman. Um, he knows more about this than, than anybody else around that I'm, I'm aware of. And, Make those decisions up front. Plan for that. Plan for your fiber. Plan for your cable expansions. You know, take Tal's advice and really think this through. And as we've done our 10-year roadmap, we, we have got it approved by our entire most senior executive team. And we are executing to it. So we're doing some very, very uh, tactical moves as we pull this stuff out. Um, this is just how, how I kind of explain it to them, that we have capacity, we have subscribers. And 
to get more capacity, you add more DOCSIS carriers, 3.1, mm -hmm. you know, IP video, et cetera, et cetera. Subscribers, you just keep doing node splits until we get to fiber deep. So for us, the current thinking is in that in 10 years, we will be 50% passive coax. We will be about 30% fiber to the X, FTTH, FTTLA, FTTT, fiber to the tap. We're still not sure, but we are going to pull fiber all the way down. And as long as you are cracking the ground, and as long as you are trenching, pull a lot of fiber. So we're going to actually pull it through the taps because we've got to have it there for fiber to the home anyway. What we do with it later, don't really know. But we have got a you know, couple ways that we can go, and when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Which way you go really depends. Interesting problem that comes out of this, and a gentleman asked it in a question, and it was a great question. As you go fiber deep, you need a lot of equipment in the head end, even when you go to digital optics. So we ran a bunch of numbers on this, and uh, this is where DAA came from because the challenge I had thrown down was when we do this, and this was pre-CCAP, came to the realization you cannot fit enough equipment in the head end to do this. So you have a choice. You can build more head end. You can build more uh, equipment. You can get denser equipment. But in the end, Kumi's law and Denard's law, which deal with dissipating heat from silicon win. And you got to cool it, you got to power it, and you got to have a rack to put it in. So you got to make some hard decisions there. The decision we made is, is that we are going to go to virtual CCAP. And we're already moving down that path, and we'll talk about that briefly. Oops. So this is really the, uh, the hard fact. And uh, so we had taken Tom's nice formula and uh, kind of reduced it down to just four elements. And uh, where we are today, and here's an interesting factoid. So we've got about 60,000 fiber to the home customers. We are GPON, not EPON. I think we're, I know we're the only US cable operator doing it. I don't know about y'all, um, if y'all if, if are doing PON at all. But I made that decision in six. I made it again in 12. Fortunately, I'm now out of the game, so it's somebody else's problem. But we've never regretted that decision. We are now doing 10 gig GPON, XGS PON, and we're actually going to be starting to do NG PON too. Variety of reasons, EPON is great. But when, when we looked at the financials, we made the GPON decision. So the way I, I describe this slide is today, regardless of tier, the average downstream usage by an individual customer when you go across the entire footprint is one megabit per second, even though they may have a, our 300 megabit tier. <coughs> the average upstream usage is about 100 kilobits per second. Now, question is, in our fiber deployments where we have one gigabit symmetrical, what do you think that usage is at peak hours? Do you think it's higher, lower, or the same? Any, any brave souls? It's exactly the same. So when we run these growths, we have the 49% kegger, which has been there since 1982. We've got a 34% kegger, which is what our financial people hope they see. And then we've got this middle tier that we actually used for budgeting. But the beauty of this is, for anybody who manages a budget, is that your budget, there's, there's the in years where you actually get real dollars put into a bank account that you can draw from. You have the out years, which is basically a promissory note or monopoly money. Because until you prove the in years, you're not going to get the out years. So, when, we, when I drew this graph out, I basically said, look, we are going to have this decision point in five years where things start diverging. Fund us for the first three years or what we want to do. 
and will reevaluate every year. Financial folks really like that because it gives them an out and it gives us an out. Everybody's happy. So the bottom line is, right, in, by 26, you need 10 gigabits to every service group at a 51 megabit high, t high usage if you're following the 49% curve. Which means that for a typical head end for us, which is about 100,000 households passed, which today for us is for, um, we're, we're, you know, full disclosure, we're an entire Cisco shop. Um, but as we go to remote FI, we're completely reevaluating and virtual CCAP. When it comes to how much equipment, you just can't fit it in there. And the most expensive thing we can do is to build a facility. So we got to figure out how do we solve for that. So this is our roadmap. This is what they agreed to, and it's sort of timing. You know, the 2.0 days are gone. The 3.0 days, we're already 32 downstreams. We have another 32 downstreams we can light up. 3.1, we've been, been deploying it for a long time. And um, if I calculate it correctly, based on the time change, um, we've been deploying it for exactly 18 hours. <laughs> um, we turned it up literally yesterday for the first time and uh, have a bunch of customers on it now. We're doing MPEG-2 to MPEG-4 everywhere. We made this decision a long time ago to do switch digital video, which helps. Our analogs are gone. And in a one gigahertz system, that's a lot of spectrum. So we're moving to a full IP deployment. We expect to be there, expect to be starting it in about two years. I'm sure you all know video is a pain, um, especially as you're transitioning. So you have to maintain, there's a, there's a spectrum tax you have to pay because we still have some analogs. We still have a bunch of set-top boxes that are probably 15 years old which customers are very happy with, and we don't like to disrupt customers until we have to. But we're going to begin doing IP deployments. So I'm, a, uh, I'm an advocate of the high split because with the RPD design as being diplexerless, and one correction I have to make to Tal is, is that we are most likely, as, you know, we, this came out of the FDX meetings, we are not going to put echo cancellation in the cable modems unless we absolutely have to. So here's a little dirty secret about FDX. Don't tell anybody. It's between us. Is that it's really not full duplex. It's only full duplex at the RPD. At the cable modem, we use the concepts of interference groups. And Tal did a, showed a great diagram where cable modems interfere with each other based on the tap values, based on loss, et cetera, attenuation. But if they don't interfere with other groups, we create what's called an interference group, meaning that cable modems in those taps are going to interfere with each other. It could be multiple taps on the low value taps, less on the high value. But then we take those interference groups and across the legs of the RPD, we create transmission groups. So to cable modems in one group, they may transmit downstream in, in one chunk of the spectrum and upstream in another, but then in a different transmission group, they'll do the exact opposite. Pardon me. They'll do the exact opposite. But in the end, when you get it back to the RPD, it sees full spectrum. So we're working with three 192 megahertz blocks in the downstream, six 96 megahertz blocks in the upstream, We've got real problems transmitting above 600 megahertz in the upstream. But smart folks um, like Corvo are, are working on it and, and Max Linear and Broadcom and Intel and et cetera. A lot of smart folks working on solving that problem. The belief is within two to three years, we'll be able to get up to 800 megahertz in the upstream, which really plays out nicely for that 200 to 800 megahertz spectrum. We'll see how it plays out. But again, if we don't plan, if we don't try to get there, we'll never get there. Extended spectrum doxis, we did not collude on slides, I would like to point out. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time. We actually have had prototypes for about three years. 
taking us out to 1.8 gigahertz. Um, and that does open up the concept of fiber to the tap, because you've got to pull the fiber through the tap anyway to do fiber to the home. The market and science will, and, and good Dr. Shannon will help decide which path we have to go. So I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to fly through some of this stuff. I apologize. I'm sure we can get a chance to talk later, but virtual CCAP. So uh, one of the things I had to do at Cox was define our virtualization architecture. And uh, we call it internally, we call it Athena, um, which was the name of a project I worked on at MIT. So since I like goofy names, I get to I, I name things. Um, should never let an engineer do marketing, by the way. Excuse me? You pay copyright for that. Um, <laughs> we'll discuss it later. Moving on. Um, what, I, what we did is I worked with the uh, Harmonic folks in about 2008, and we came up with this block diagram kind of explaining what's in a CMTS. The video's not in there for CCAP, but you all know what, what that stuff looks like. Then took it and broke it into blocks. And obviously, if you just have layer one, that's the remote phi, it's still got some Ethernet chunks. If you just have layer two, layer one and two, you got a remote Mac phi. Basically, Anything that has to be at line rate has to be at silicon. It's just the way it goes. Because no amount of software ever written has generated a single photon. You need to have a physical device to do that, whether it's an ASIC, an FPGA, whatever that is. But the layer two functions, which go back to my days developing Unix schedulers, are all software. So we can do some pretty cool stuff with that. Layer three, that's been software forever. But the smart folks at Aris and Cisco and CASA and, and Harmonic, and I'm sure there's other companies, Vesema, have been working on this and trying to figure out how can they, how can they make this even better. So we've been working on this thing we call a split Mac. So we took the upper layer Mac functions, the, the things above bonding, and do that in software and bonding and down, we're doing in the lower Mac. We're seeing how it works out. Don't know for sure, but it looks pretty good. So how do you take this and then virtualize it? So it, it pretty much looks like that. So that Ethernet switch complex is the equivalent of the backplane on a CMTS or CCAP. The stuff on the right is your physical entity, remote phi nodes, a remote phi shelf. Um, the fiber to the tap if you go that route, or an OLT, because we are also doing virtual OLTs. We are um, a proponent of CORD, Central Office Reimagined as a data center. I jokingly started calling it HERD, Head End Reimagined, Reimagined as a data center. Somebody was kind enough to steal that idea. Um, the lawyers will be in touch. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter as long as this stuff gets done. So the DOCSIS packet core is your Mac multiple 10 gig links to that. Everything below that is all software. The video on demand core, broadcast, SDV, orchestration, critical, NFV controllers, critical. But when you start thinking about how are you gonna virtualize it, this is what I believe what it's gonna look like. <coughs> a lot of work to be done here, by the way. We just, uh, we started a working group with a number of operators, um, and we are starting to really dig into the details. And what we realized is you got to have some super smart network kids involved in this. Because that Ethernet switch compact complex is really hard. And they are working at how do we use SDN to control that? How does network function virtualization play into this? So what we're defining is a way in which we can have a virtual CCAP reference architecture such that cable labs can test virtual network functions against it and reduce the time it takes for us to deploy these functions. Because if we're all testing the same thing, cable labs is a logical place to do that. And we're really depending on folks like SCTE to help us dig into some of these details and figure out 
the, uh, the minutia that we are likely going to miss as we go through it. So on to extended spectrum DOCSIS. One of the uh, enabling technologies behind this, of course, is the digital optics. You get back a bunch of dBs. Um, as you go to digital pre-distortion, you get back more dBs. And, uh, and there's a choice you have to make. You can take those dBs and you can get another 100 or 200 feet. You can also use it, you know, which is about 10 to 20% better. You can also use it to increase your modulation you might get 20, 30% better. Or you can go another couple gigahertz where you get about 200% better. Now, we did testing on our, our trunks and we get about 10 gigabits. We tested our feeders, we get or gigahertz. We tested our feeders, we get about um, six gigahertz. We tested our drop cables, we get three to four gigahertz. We got a whole crew of really smart people sending all kinds of signals down probably about 80 varieties of cables right now, trying to figure out what's realistic and how do we communicate that through SETE, through Cable Lab, through vendors, so we can, we can figure out what is really, you know, what is probable. Maybe possible, but is it probable? And that's what we're trying to figure out. But there's a whole bunch of capacity in there. And what it's really enabled by is those DACs and the ADCs. As they go multi-gigahertz, they can do so much processing. It's, it's incredible. And that gives us the ability to go to a lot of these higher frequencies. So talk about life cycle of the HFC plant. I know I'm kind of flying through this stuff. Classic stuff has been around a long time, right? Fiber deep is where we're going. Fiber to the top, extended spectrum, not sure. We'll figure that out. But in the end, it becomes all fiber. So for us, 10 years, 50% passive coax, 30% fiber to the home, 20% will be um, pretty much what we're doing today. Might be node one, still might be node five. We have a lot of very rural settings. I don't think in Northwest Arkansas, they're really gonna have to worry too much about needing a. 10 gigabit symmetrical link. I mean, they're happy to have running water. <laughs> um, don't tell anybody I said that. Um, it's, a, it's a running joke with Arkansas and Alabama to South, uh, South Carolinians, so anyway. Um, but you gotta have the fiber. You know, rule number one, never can have too much fiber. So. Ooh, that didn't come out nice. It's probably a Windows box. Um, as you look at the transformations from uh, the day one at what we were providing, we were 12, when I, when I came to Cox, we were at 12,000 households passed. We had one QAM serving those, and it was only a 27 megabit QAM because it was only 64 QAM. And, uh, I spent a lot of time bugging this guy about how do we do 256, and it became my job to go to all of our sites and, and actually prove we could do 256, and then I, he's probably just saying, I just shut up already, you're just <laughs> killing me here. But then we went through the same thing with, with 16 QAM upstream because we were QPSK. Our plant folks didn't actually believe we could do it. We did it. Now we're doing 3.1 and we're doing 1024 to 4096 qualm down and we're doing 1k qualm up. So we can do it. It's just is the juice worth the squeezing? And in these cases it was. So when you look at these increases over time through 3.0 to 3.1 to ESD, FTTT, uh, we need a better name for that. That's FT cubed. No, it sounds, it's way too geeky. Um, but when you look at what we're potentially able to do from, from classic to today, 1,000% increase on the downstream, 200% increase on the upstream. When we look at going to 3.1, 350, 1,600. When you go from 3.1 to whatever it is, 
it's going to be another 125 time increase. So soup beginning to end, it's 40 million times more capacity. Now, it's not just bandwidth, it's reductions and subs, it's node splits, it's passive, it's more spectrum. But when you run that math, that's a lot. And as Tal showed, you know, HFC not only has a long life, it has a long, useful life. But it does have an end of life. So as we go through that, we have some very difficult choices to make in there. So again, we did not collude on slides. But um, we're basically saying the same thing, that you've got to run the fiber through the tap. And you have decisions to make there. You may leave it as dark fiber, or I like to call it shadow fiber, because it's shadowing the coax. But if you do need to turn it up, you can turn it up on a per subscriber basis. You could put an RPD in the tap. We actually have prototypes. Um, it's drawing way too much power. But I've been told that we'll be able to get RPDs down to about a five watt um, number which means we can power it with our existing plants. I know Europe is totally different. Um, but again, you, know, you have to make the same decisions we do. We can get fiber-like speeds out of coax. Because once you're down to the tap and you only have a drop, you don't have to worry about some of these upper spectrum, upper, upper frequencies. You get to ride that a long way. And customers don't care, in most cases, whether it's fiber or coax. They just want to get to what is most important to them. So we'll see how that plays out. I think, I think it has a lot of great potential. But we have to have many more discussions around that. So kind of in closing, when we have incremental capital needs, because we're all capital constrained. Our, our CapEx has not changed since 2000 when I started at Cox. We have the exact same CapEx number. So anything we do is incremental to that. So we have to really think through, you know, as I explained it, is we've got our growth rates. We argue over that. It's a good argument. We're accelerating 3-1 very quickly. We will have 750 CBR8s deployed over the next three years. Um, but we are also going to begin deploying remote PHY and virtual CCAP at that same time point. Have upstream capacity challenges. We have to optimize video. We're going all IP as quickly as we can, but the reality is we still have set-top boxes that were deployed in 1996. Um, and customers are very happy. And we don't like to impact customers. Churn is horrible. The cost of getting a new customer is horrible. The cost of retaining an existing customer is not so bad. Fiber deep, got to do it. No choice. Gigabit is, is what it's about. But the only application I see today that needs gigabit is a speed test. <laughs> and you can only get a gigabit if you keep it on your network, because the prevailing wind speed on the internet today is about 70 megabits sustained. So it has to be on your network. And that is a key advantage for us. Because as cable operators, we have exceptional networks. We have the ability to keep services on our networks, whether through caching, you know, with CDNs, content generation, keeping it all as close to the customer as we can. And as we move equipment out of the head ends, there's more we can do with that rack space with simple blade servers or one RU x86. And this is where virtualization is going to really transform our business. And then CPE migration, it's really painful. So we try to be as gentle as we can with the customers when we do this. And that's just an important thing is anytime you touch the customer, there is a good chance of creating a, uh, creating a problem for them. And we really don't want to do that. 
but we know we have to do it. So we prefer to do it once and once only. So when we go out and we, we touch the tap, that is the time we want to touch the customer and give them new CPE that's very capable. And with the new 3.1 technologies, we think that gives us a good 10-year roadmap for CPE, which is, which is actually, for us, is pretty good because we started deploying 3.0 in 2000, memory's fading, 2008. And we are almost 100% 3.0 CPE to this day because we can only change out 7% a year. If we accelerate it, it might be 10% a year. So keep all that in mind as you do it. Good luck. Thanks for having me here and appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. Oh,